Good afternoon, everyone. It's me again, Denmark Aranas, a fourth-year medical clerk, welcoming all of you to my last lecture for this online lecture series. I will be discussing the approach to menstrual abnormalities and menstrual pain. Again, I would like to start with some disclaimers. First, I somehow deviated with the flow of discussion in the provided reference for the topic, which is the last trans from last year. I will justify later why I presented it this way as we go along with the discussion. Second, I browsed over Harrison for the topic. However, I did not, I did not find any chapter dis discussing about it. Instead, I used Williams Gynecology as a reference for my additional inputs in the discussion and also included some of my experiences as a clerk while rotating in ob department. Last disclaimer, I would like to ask help again from my fellow medical clerks in answering your questions after the discussion because I might miss some important points that they could help us be enlightened with. So please, batch 2020, help me. Thanks. Next thing I would like to do is to make you understand the scope of the discussion. When we say approach, what do we mean by that? Well, as for medicine one, the goal is to teach you how to approach or let's say attack a chief complaint with appropriate history taking questions and physical examination maneuvers, taking into account the right differential diagnosis. When you encounter such chief complaint, you will not be concerned yet in knowing the proper diagnostics to request nor the ideal management for the possible etiologies. We will be learning these clinical strategies in medicine too. So now you know what an approach means in medicine one. And for this afternoon, we'll be discussing the approach to one of the most common chief complaints in ob department, the menstrual abnormalities and menstrual pain. Okay, let's start. Here's the topic outline. First, I would like to emphasize the importance of knowing normal menstruation for us to differentiate what an abnormal menstruation really is. So it's a must to establish for the foundation of your knowledge regarding what is normal before feeding you with a variety of pathologies as differentials. Second topic is the discussion about how to remember and properly categorize the differentials for menstrual abnormalities. The next is history-taking discussion, emphasizing the important things to consider in ruling in or out a differential using the components of history. Fourth is the PE. Maneuvers will be discussed briefly because you will learn this in greater detail in your ob lectures and ob -OSCI. Lastly, I would like to spend more time in discussing the FIGO classification system of AUB, the palm coin. As for the learning objectives, at the end of this lecture, you should be able to know the normal values of menstruation and be familiar with different etiologies of menstrual abnormalities. Second, to know the appropriate approach for this chief complaint by asking pertinent questions in the history and be familiar with appropriate maneuvers in PE. And lastly, to have a good understanding of the FIGO classification system, the palm coin. Let's go now to the normal values. This table is a must know, and I want all of you to concentrate on the normal values and memorize them. So for the first clinical dimension, the frequency of menses. This is just the interval from one cycle to another. And the normal value for frequency is 24 to 38 days. Regular menses now have a variation of seven to nine days. 
Duration is the number of days of bleeding in a single menstrual period, which normally lasts less than or equal to 8 days. For the last dimension, the normal volume can be defined objectively and subjectively. For the objective normal definition value, it is 5 to 80 ml. And subjectively, as a menstrual bleeding, that does not interfere with a woman's physical, social, emotional, and or material quality of life. According to Williams, several studies documented the lack of correlation between patient perception of loss and objective measurements. In the clinics, we really do not quantify the amount of blood loss. Instead, we consider more the subjective perception of the patient. And when the woman's physical, social, and other parameters are affected, prompting consult, the clinician would now consider this already an abnormal volume of menstrual bleeding. So for the normal value we are of volume, we are more concerned with the subjective definition. Okay, let's review. So for the frequency, the normal value you have to memorize is 24 to 38 days. And for the regular, regularity of menses, it's 70, 7 to 9 days variation. Normal duration is less than or equal to 8 days. And the normal volume is the subjective definition of uh, the perception of the patient that is more important. Now that we have defined the normal values for the different clinical dimension of menstruation, let's now define what abnormal is. Abnormal uterine bleeding is the term used to describe any symptomatic variation from normal menstruation. Take note, any deviation from the normal values we have defined a while block back plus symptomatic variation, okay? has to be symptomatic. An acute AUB requires immediate intervention to prevent further loss. And a symptom that you should watch out for here is hypotension that might progress to shock if not abated. So this is a very urgent case of AUB. Like for example, in torrential bleeding postpartum. Chronic AUB is present at least with the majority of the past six months. Symptoms associated here are easy fatigability, weakness, weight loss, and other range of symptoms related to a chronic pathology of bleeding, like for example, endometrial cancer. The International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics develop new defini definitions and terminology of AUB. They form the FIGO Menstrual Disorders Committee. And among the most common, commonly used terms were menorrhagia and metrorrhagia. Menorrhagia is a prolonged or heavy menstrual bleed at regular intervals, while metrorrhagia is an irregular heavy menstrual bleed at the intermenstrual period, meaning between two normal cycles. Please correct the one in your trans. It was interchanged there. So for menorrhagia, it's regular. And for metrorrhagia, it's irregular. The committee also recommended the abandonment of the term DUB because it is poorly defined term and it is it has been used as a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning you have ruled out all of the possible organic lesions and nothing was identified as the cause of AUB. What I would like to highlight is the palm coin system for classification for those in the reproductive years. This will be discussed extensively at the last section of this lecture. So here are some of the various differentials for a non-pregnant woman with menstrual abnormalities that we will be discussing in this lecture. According to Williams, 
the factors that impact the incidence of AUB most greatly are age and reproductive status. So we must approach these different etiologies with correlation to the two demographic data, age and re reproductive status. So here is how I want you to approach menstrual abnormalities. You consider the age and reproductive status of your patient. According to Dr. Lucas, the average menarch in the Philippines is at 10 years old, while the average menopause is 49 years old. These ages will be used as important markers for the different reproductive stages of a woman. So for those less than 10 years old, the reproductive stage is premenarchal. Now for those greater than 10 to 49, are the, are the reproductive age, and for those greater than 49 years old, it's postmenopausal. At these stages, they will have different diseases that they are more predisposed to. To explain their abnormal menstruation, at childhood, their reproductive status is premenarchal. And the most common causes that could explain the abnormal bleeding are trauma and infections. Trauma is related to foreign body insertion, while infections are related to sexual abuse. These etiologies should worry you, and you should inform the appropriate officials whenever you encounter such cases. However, what should you consider when a child presents to you with an early menarche? With associated heavy menstrual bleeding. Williams mentioned that it could be related to precocious puberty, ovarian neoplasms, and accidental ingestion of medications increasing estrogen levels. Next, we go to the reproductive stage of a woman. Uh, this includes the adolescents, middle aged, and perimenopausal women. The most common etiology would be structural and non-structural causes as classified by palm coin. And of course, the contraceptive misuse or side effects that they are taking for family planning. Lastly, the elderly female at menopausal or postmenopausal reproductive stage, the most common cause of abnormal uterine bleeding is endometrial cancer. And according to Williams, it could also be related to hormone replacement therapy that this age group is taking as a side effect. These differentials inside the dashed rectangle may be found in any of those age groups or, in, or reproductive stage mentioned before because they are systemic diseases that could manifest regardless of the two demographics. So these are the generalizations you all have to be familiar with and you have to keep in mind whenever you encounter mental abnormalities in ob patient encounter. Okay, let's put these differentials at the side while we discuss the history taking. Just notice that these etiologies related to the part of the history we are discussing will be highlighted later. So here's the usual format of history taking we do in medicine. And this now is what we have in ob history. As you can see, prenatal and ob history were added. Under the ob history, it is comprised of four parts. The menstrual history, ob, OB, OB score, gynae history, and sexual history. And for you to remember that, just associate the Philippine Obstetrical and Gynecological Society, in short, POGS, with the mnemonic MOGS for ob history. Okay? POGS is for MOGS. This will be discussed in detail in your ob lectures, and I will just highlight some important points instead. As for the menstrual history, remember the mnemonic Midas and associate King Midas of Greek mythology 
as the king of menstruation or whatever way you want. We ask the age of first menstruation and that's called menarche. Interval if regular or in irregular, duration, how long the cycle is, amount, how many pads did she use, and any associated symptoms like dysmenorrhea. And then ask also about the subsequent menses. Okay, here now. Uh, what I want you to stick in your minds is the importance of LMP, or the last menstrual period. Forget everything else except for this one, okay? This is the first day of the patient's last menses. LMP allows us to rule in or out the possibility of pregnancy. And we would want to know that because we are thinking of pregnancy complications as possible explanation for their bleeding. They may be having an abortion, molar, or even ectopic pregnancy. However, I will not be discussing the, these pregnancy complications, for this is not the scope of our discussion. We focus only on the non-pregnant related differentials of uterine bleeding. Okay, please don't forget the LMP. Your OB preceptors will surely look for it, and it will be your basis in computing for AOG or age of gestation and EDC or expected date of confinement. LMP is very important, don't forget. Next is the sexual history. Here we ask about a sensitive topic. So please be prudent enough to tell the importance of extracting this information from the patient, okay? Quietark is the age of first contact and the rest. As you can see, as you can see uh, we can detect trauma and infections in this part of the history. Of course, if the patient has more than one sexual partner, and does not use protection like condom, we can consider sexually transmitted infections. And aside from bleeding, an associated symptom we must take note of would be discharge. Higher CS and myomectomy predisposes a woman in formation of uterine fibroids. Now, when you hear fibroids, you also have to think of Myoma or leomyoma. These terms are all the same. So fibroids or myoma or leomyoma, these terms are used interchangeably. And I will be discussing this further later. Here, I just want you to associate these ob gynae surgeries with the formation of uterine fibroids. Okay, next. Contraceptive history of patient is also important because the misuse of it could also lead to abnormal menstruation. And it is a common side effect of placing IUD at the onset of placement, which usually resolves through time. Be familiar with these risk factors for the development of endometrial cancer. And if you remember, we said that endometrial cancer is commonly seen among elderly or postmenopausal. Well, here are the factors that predispose them in having the carcinoma. Older age, greater than 35 years old, early menarche, late menopause, nalar parity, unopposed estrogen, and others. The common denominator for all of this is the rise in the level of estrogen and or prolonged time of exposure to estrogen. So estrogen is the main culprit in the pathology of endometrial cancer. As for these disorders that could be related to a systemic disease, you will ask these things. For bleeding disorders, in the ROS, ask for related symptoms like fatigue, dyspnea, bruising, petechiae, or fever. This may suggest hematologic malignancy. Also ask about the use of anticoagulant meds. And also review the medical history for liver or renal diseases that may hamper the production of clotting factors leading to bleeding events. For thyroid disease, I know all of you are familiar with the classic presentation of hypo and hyperthyroidism. All you need to do is to ask this 
And if they are presenting with those symptoms, together with heavy menstrual bleeding, oligomenorrhea, or even amenorrhea. For celiac disease, it is mostly related to secondary amenorrhea caused by nutritional deficiencies related with the disease due to malabsorption. Like for example, zinc deficiency impairs the production and secretion of FSH and LH, leading to abnormalities in ovarian development. Symptoms that might direct you to celiac disease are abdominal pain, bloating, and bowel changes after ingestion of gluten-containing food like wheat. Next is the medication use. Of course, anticoagulants are related to heavy or prolonged uterine bleeding. What I want you to be familiar with are the medication classes and substances that can cause hyperprolactinemia, resulting in oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea. Hyperprolactinemic amenorrhea happens because of estrogen deficiency. So if you have a patient who are taking antipsychotics and complaints of amenorrhea, one of the strongest differentials would be drug-induced hyperprolactinemia. And you could explain it to the patient as a side effect of the drug, decreasing her estrogen in the body. Lastly, in the history, you have to check for recent illness that might cause hypothalamic dysfunction. And also the lifestyle of the patient could explain abnormalities in menstruation, like in the case of functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is related to three factors, stress, excessive exercise, or weight loss related. Basically, FHA relates to the aberration in positile GnRH secretion, which in turn causes impairment of FSH and LH. So please, for your amenorrheic patient, consider drug-related or lifestyle-related causing hypoestrogenism as a possible explanation for their problem. Now let's move on to the physical examination. Of course, we have to start with the general examination. Expect the patient for signs of bleeding like PTK, nose or gum bleeding. Check if they present a classic PCOS case with hirsutism, acne, acanthosis nigricans, and obesity. Also inspect if there is thyroid enlargement in the patient and assess the breast for milky nipple discharge that would indicate now hyperprolactinemia. An important aspect of PE among ob patients with menstrual abnormalities would be a complete pelvic examination. I will not discuss this in detail for you will learn this, learn this in ob lectures. What I would like you to know is its importance. The picture above is speculum examination while the one below is bimanual examination. We do these maneuvers to determine the site of bleeding and the possible areas where we, where we would find it are vulva, vagina, urethra, anus, or perineum. Palpation of an enlarged uterus could really hint you about the possible structural causes of bleeding, which we will be discussing later. And we would also be able to detect other abnormal findings like presence of mass, laceration, ulceration, foreign body, and vaginal or cervical discharge. So please learn these two PE maneuvers well in your ob decury. Now, what do we need to consider if upon PE, you detect current bleeding? Check first the vital signs of the patient. Assess for the hemodynamic stability of the patient before doing anything else so that if the patient presents to be in shock due to excessive bleeding, resuscitative measures could be done ahead to save the patient. And you have to look at the cervical os for the presence and volume of bleeding, at the vaginal vault 
to take note of the presence of blood or blood clots? The picture shown here is that of cervical cancer. The cervix becomes friable from the neoplastic changes that occurs, and this usually bleeds post-coitus. So screen patients for cervical cancer, those who comes to the ER with post-coital bleeding. We proceed to the last section of my discussion, the FIGO classification of AUB, the palm coin system. This is a very high yield topic because in clerkship, you will frequently encounter this. Your resident will ask you about the differentials for AUB and this is what you should answer. Remember AUB every time you see a coin on your palm. That way, you will never forget. POM stands for polyp, adenomyosis, leiomyoma, and malignancy. These are structural etiologies of AUB, while COIN stands for coagulopathy, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial, iatrogenic, and not otherwise classified. And these are non-structural causes of AUB. And we will go through each one by one. First is AUBP, endometrial polyps. These are overgrowth of endometrial tissue containing glands, trauma, and blood vessels covered with epithelium. Two types of endometrial polyp are shown here in the picture. Pedunculated polyps are those with the stock, while sessile polyps are those without. This is the most commonly found in reproductive age women and estrogen stimulation is the underlying mechanism in its development. These polyps increases the overall surface area and they are more friable, leading to he heavier blood loss. As you can see, there could also be a polyp found at the cervix. Next is AUBA. Adenomyosis from the name itself, adeno means glands, and meiosis means ectopically located at myometrium. It also has endometrial trauma. This condition leads to symmetric, take note, symmetric uterine enlargement, as you can see grossly in this picture. Keywords to describe it are symmetric, smooth, and buggy. Okay, remember. Uh, you have to take note of adenomyosis when you hear that word buggy. The pathologic diagnosis is required for its diagnosis, and this is how it would look like. You would see presence of endometrial gland and stroma within the myometrium. Transvaginal ultrasound and MRI could help in the diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, and this is how it would look like. Take note of the symmetric thickening in both pictures, and this characteristic differentiates it from leiomyomas. The most significant risk factor for its development was said to be multiparity, but other ways could be the cause of its development, like, for example, in dilatation and curettage, CS and abortion, there would be penetration of endometrial glands and stroma past the basalis layer. We now go to AUBL, leiomyoma. Like what I told you in the first part of the lecture, it is the same with myomas or uterine fibroids. Leiomyoma from the name itself, leio means smooth, and in this case, it stands for smooth muscle, and meiosis means ectopically located at myometrium, they also cause uterine enlargement. However, the key words to associate it would be asymmetric nodularities of uterus. Take note, leiomyoma asymmetric, adenomyosis is symmetric. As you can see in this picture, we classify leiomyoma according to the given parameters by FIGO. And this is just ni nice to know. Submucosal leiomyoma 
mass are those found at the endometrium and they are related to the heaviest menstrual bleed among the other classifications. Intramural is within the myometrium, subserosas below the serosa of the uterus, and we also have the hybrid leomyomas that traverse the endometrium to the serosa of the uterus. Like adenomyosis, surgical procedures could produce myometrial injury and can initiate its development. And as for the explanation of heavy bleeding, it is the same with polyps because they increase the overall surface area of the endometrium. So what do you see here? You might be thinking that this is an enlarged uterus itself after a total abdominal hysterectomy. Well, you are wrong. Actually, this is just a myomectomy or removal of a myoma from the uterus. The humongous mass is the subserosal leomyoma, where the small one is the intramural myoma. And to give you a better visualization of this subserosal myoma, it is of approximately a size of a volleyball. Could you imagine that? A mass really larger than the uterus itself. This is an actual case that I would never forget. Let's all remember my gynec patient, patient JP, a 32-year-old female with a diagnosis of G0, leomyoma uteri, subserous and intramural, status post myomectomy. I was filled with O when I went in and scrubbed inside the OR to assist in the procedure. It is really true that in BGHMC, there you would see the most bizarre cases like this one. The subserous myoma is actually located at the fundal area of the uterus, while the intramural at the anterior wall of the uterus. That explains the volleyball on top of the uterus, there in the slide. You might be wondering, why did the residents just opt for myomectomy? And why not take away everything, as that mass is so big that it could be cancerous? Well, I thought about that too, but the resident told me that leomyomas are really benign, take note, benign, neoplasm of smooth muscle, and it does not progress to leomyosarcoma, and it seldomly recurs. And I was like, whoa, when I learned that, and the resident added that the patient is G0, meaning she never had pregnancy. So her chance of childbearing should not be taken away from her, as the patient was also desirous of pregnancy at her age. A myomectomy is obviously the best management for that giant mass to manage the patient as it already causes bowel obstruction, aside from the heavy menstrual bleeding. I would just like to share now how I transported the myoma to the histopath lab. Well, I used a six liters gallon of water and it almost filled the container. Imagine that. So there, you must remember your patients to really learn in clerkship. I hope whenever you see a volleyball, you remember Leo Myoma. We move on to the next, AUBM, malignancy. At the history-taking section of our discussion, we discuss the different risk factors in developing endometrial carcinoma, and we identify the common denominator among it all is an unopposed estrogen stimulation. Here, let's just emphasize the following. Obesity has an increased estrone levels due to adipose tissue being converted by aromatase. The picture below is a granulosa cell tumor, which is an ovarian tumor that is estrogen producing. And lastly, here is an infographic about Lynch syndrome or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. And you can see it is related to various malignancy of different organ systems. And uterus is one of it. 
It is said that there is 40 to 50 percent risk for developing endometrial cancer when you are diagnosed with Lynch syndrome. We are done with the structural causes of AUB. Let's now proceed to the non-structural causes. First is AUBC, coagulopathy. What I just wanted you to focus on in, in this table is that there is positive screen conditions for an underlying disorder of hemostasis. They are as follows, okay? And I want you to remember that the most common disorder of hemostasis diagnosed in those with heavy menstrual bleeding is mild von Willebrand disease, which is a problem of clotting mechanism in the body. Next, we discuss AUBO, ovulatory dysfunction. To understand this, let's just do a simple, a very, very simple review of the menstrual cycle. In the first half of the cycle, it is estrogen predominant, which increases proliferation. At day 14, there is ovulation. And from here, progesterone takes over and decreases proliferation. In unovulatory cases, there is no ovulation. So there is no switch to progesterone. So estrogen predominates. Estrogen builds the endothelium. And at the time, the endothelium exceeds its vascular supply, it dies, and irregular bleeding occurs that may be heavy, then spotting, then heavy again. Anovulation usually occurs in extremes of reproductive life, from first few years after menarche for adolescents and at perimenopausal age. Adolescence has an immature HPO axis that fails to provide positive feedback of estradiol to cause LH surge, which is vital for ovulation. This one resolves usually two to three years later. However, for the perimenopausal women whose HPO axis lacks synchronization, they, their uh, ovaries decline over time. And this does not resolve but persists. Next is AUBI, iatrogenic, meaning AUB is due to the medical devices given by the doctor. Listed here are the drug classification that causes AUB. What I want to emphasize here is the last one. The antibiotics and anticonvulsants that when taken with OCP will lead to AUB. These are cephalosporins, chloramphenicol, macrolide, and barbiturates. The drug interaction with OCP leads to increased levels of estrogen and manifests as irregular bleeding. Memorize these four drugs, okay? I leave that to you. Okay, next, AUBE, endometrial. Listed here are the factors for you to consider primary, or, primary disorder of endometrium. It is in women with predictable cyclic menses, normal, men, normal ovulation that presents as heavy menstrual bleed and intermenstrual bleed. And take note that other causes should be absent, meaning it is a diagnosis of exclusion. When you have already ruled out all other organic causes, that is the time you consider a primary disorder of endometrium. We are now at the last uh, classification. AUBN, not otherwise classified. This classification is poorly defined, inadequately examined, and extremely rare. This includes AV malformation that may be congenital or surgical operation induced. Uterine is mucil. Uh, is a cesarean scar defect, and it is an indentation representing myometrial discontinuity. As you can see in this ultrasound, and also foreign body and trauma belong, belong to this classification. 
FIGO classification of AUB also provided a protocol for the proper documentation of findings. A woman may be diagnosed with one or even multiple causes. Shown here is the sample for single entity, letter A, and multiple entity documentation, letter B. I will no longer discuss this in detail, for this is just nice to know. I will leave this to you as well. Well, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. And I would like to end my presentation with a phrase from, praise and, from my favorite praise and worship song from Hill Song entitled New Wine. Here it goes. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Let's just take a moment to praise God and pray. Lord God, we praise you for all the blessings that you have showered upon us. Help us realize that even at these times of uncertainties, we still have a lot to be grateful for. Help us realize, Lord, that during these difficult times, you are molding us into whatever you want us to be. Give us the strength and will to accomplish all, your, all our school works in medicine. Give us the vision that appreciates all these trials of learning medicine as your way of making us your vessel of your healing grace. May we, may we trust this process of training, Lord, and learn to trust you that after all our sacrifices, you will bring a new wine out of us. We offer it all up to you, Lord. We came here with nothing, Lord, but all you have given us, perseverance and determination in reaching our dreams. May, we, may you continue to guide us in this journey, Lord. And at the times you falter, please wake our hearts, wake our passion, wake our desire of serving others. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lastly, Allow me to campaign for the upcoming elections in Momfi. I do believe that the next person to sit on the Iron Throne of Momfi is our very own Daenerys in the image of Jan Pauline Picar Bautista. Please vote for her as Momfi president. Thank you. To all Momfians, please heed my word. She is definitely deserving of being our president. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.